it seems to me that some of us are trying to abandon what belongs to us while the outsiders are beginning to make good use of them. But I believe that it is the lack of understanding the correct appreciation and application of what we have that is leading us to the situation where we are today, why some people are beginning to run around as if you have to go out and look for something else to make yourself relevant. In this presentation, my position is that instead of looking elsewhere for models, this church, the Anglican church, has enough within it to make its clergy effective in ministry. If, and if only, they understand what they have and believe them to be of God and take delight in them as important ingredients for effective ministry in this generation. So sometimes the challenge is that there is a living tool that is available to all but if it is placed in the hands of a dead man it is also dead but if the living tool is rightly appreciated and is in the hands of a living heart a living soul then it becomes doubly active full of life and is able to bring life even to those who are in the pews and this is why I said that celebrating the Anglican heritage is fundamental to effective Anglican ministry in the 21st century. And this is the heart of the discussion we're going to have over the next uh, one hour or so. Celebrating the Anglican heritage as a panacea for effective Anglican ministry in the 21st century. Let me declare to you that I have been a member of the Anglican Church nine months before I was born. Are you surprised? <laughs> so which means I am a thorough Anglican. Since my mother was pregnant carrying me, I have been coming to the Anglican Church. But I can also tell you that I have been receiving life within this church. And so for me, I, by the grace of God, understand that God has deposited a lot within this church to bless his people. And as I've moved around, each time I come back to say, thank God for the Anglican church. In the course of my doctoral studies, I won't tell you where or how many years ago. I took a few months off from my regular routine in the church. And I went around to attend some so-called charismatic Pentecostal churches to actually see what they offer. I started the first week. The second week, the third week, it became a problem for me. Why? Because I found that what I was receiving was so shallow. All I had was we'll get to the church every Sunday and then some people will start to lead us in singing and praises and praises and praises and praises. It's called praise worship. And after that, Somebody will come before us and say that it's time to give offering. They will tell us about it. And they will give offering. And thereafter, then somebody will come. The pastor this time, open the Bible and begin to teach and talk to us for about 40 minutes or one hour. And after that, it is time to go home. And each time I ask, where is the psalm? 
Where is the reading of the Old Testament? Where is the reading of the New Testament? And then the exposition of the, se of the several texts that have been read. Where is time for real prayers? Prayer not only for yourself but for the church. Prayer for the state. Prayer for the needy. Prayer for the poor. Whenever there was prayer there, I realized it was more or less just pray for yourself and that about. And then I began to cherish that, gosh, we have so much that is rich in our tradition. That our own prayer is not just about yourself. You pray for your neighbor. You pray even for your enemy. You pray for the government. You pray for the world. So much rich in prayers. And it's not just that. You get to understand the scripture. You read the Psalms. You read the Old Testament. You read the New Testament. And there is a powerful exposition that is supposed to accompany that. And how come that Anglicans are abandoning this heritage and they are running elsewhere just because they will have the opportunity of dancing or clapping and then maybe sometimes somebody coming to preach and bring all kinds of strange teachings together and you believe that is the way to go my brothers i pray that in our generation we shall not fail god god has called us to this church to serve and he has a reason for that therefore it is imperative that we learn to celebrate the heritage of this church and use it to be effective in ministering to the people of God in the 21st century. It is possible. It is doable. It is achievable. And God has been doing it through the centuries. And even in our generation, it is still possible. May God use you. May God depend on you. So, what is the Anglican heritage? By Anglican heritage, we refer to the inherited teachings and practices of the church that have been given to us to succeeding generations of Anglicans as informed by the history and cherished beliefs of the church. The heritage is rooted in reformed history, encapsulated in its worship, depicted in the Book of Common Prayer, and to which the historic formularies bear witness through the 39 articles of religion and of the Order of Bishops, priests, and deacons. So we have a rich heritage. We do not have the whole time in our hands, so I'm just going to highlight a few of those areas, and if at all possible, maybe take one or two questions or contributions at the end of our discussion. So let me first start by talking about the history. Guided by our history. It's vital to appeal to the history of the church as a way of calling it back to its mission and to enable it to remain effective. We will highlight here very briefly some important facts from history as an indication of where this church ought to be moving from time to time. The birth of the Anglican church is traceable to a combination of factors in the 16th century and they are both spiritual and modern. The events that followed the separation of this church from Rome reveal that we have a church that was born, one, to encourage corporate worship and deep spirituality informed by the scripture. Somebody say corporate worship. It's very important for us. You have to understand the history of this church that we came out of a system that was not encouraging corporate worship the way we understand it. A system whereby maybe the father knew everything and would do everything. But we came to a church whereby all of us together will be involved in praying and worshiping. So it's very important. And that is why you find that today so many of what we do come together by way of corporate worship. That is why it's not just a place where we gather and everybody can do their own. We have to pray together. For instance, when you look at the suffrages soon after the Apostles' Creed, you find that there 
we engage in prayer. The minister says, O oh Lord, show your mercy upon us. And what is the response? And grant us your salvation. O oh Lord, guide and defend our rulers and give them wisdom from above. Endue your ministers with righteousness and make your chosen people joyful. O oh Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O oh Lord, because there is none other that rules the world, but only you, O oh God. O oh God, make clean our hearts within us and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Now, can you imagine how much prayers have gone into what you have just done now? If I were to be leading, bidding prayers and say, let us stand and now pray for the king, or let us pray for our rulers, everybody will be saying their own. It can take you three, four, five minutes to make up your own prayer. But here, as a corporate church that prays together, we have prayed together using the same words with emphasis before the Almighty God. This church is rich. A church that was born for corporate prayers. People of God, my prayer today is that as we gather from time to time to pray together, the Lord will honor our prayers. But let me beg you, because this is part of the problem. People think when you pray and you read these kind of prayers, it's not effective. But I tell you that God answers those prayers as well. But it is important that we pray them from our hearts. This is the problem of the clergy. If you are the clergyman who comes there and you are just reading it as if to say you are not sure what you are doing, it will appear boring. But if it's coming right from your heart, and you say, oh Lord, show your mercy upon us. And the response comes as powerful as that. Surely you know you are praying. It, it hurts me when after the suffrages, the verticals and responses, somebody now says, let us pray. So I say, what have you been doing all this while? This is the error of so many of us. We should simply continue in prayer. It is important that we know what is right and do it. Let the prayer come from right inside of us. Even though we are rightly guided by what we have in the prayer book. So we have a church that was born to encourage both corporate worship and deep spirituality informed by scripture. And when you look carefully into all this, you find that each of these prayers have come from various portions of the scripture. So if you say that this church is not a Bible church, then I don't know where you're going to find one. This church is born through scripture and to live for scripture. Number two, this church was born to bring the word of God to the people in their vernacular, in the language of their understanding, not in Latin or any strange language. Let us be clear about that. It hurts me now that some of us believe that until you speak English, God does not understand. And that is where we are going now. What our prayer book affirms is that you'll be able to minister to the people in the language they understand. In the language that they speak, we are a church of the vernacular. And that is it. So this church deliberately moved from talking Latin to the people into speaking to them the language that they understand. And that is why, you know, there has been several revisions to ensure we are speaking the language of the people. Bringing the word of God to them. I know how much so many of us cherish uh, King James Version of the Bible. But I keep asking, we don't speak King James language anymore. Why is it that we can't really use the version of the Bible that we actually speak. And that is the Anglican thing. That's why most times you find that our Psalms are already in the prayer book. The language of the Psalm goes with the language of our prayer. So let me encourage you to be, to be aware of all this. So when you are leading your people in worship, and you are speaking this language, and then you go to read the Psalm from uh, King James Version, you are already contradicting yourself. 
And it is important when we are talking also about corporate worship that we don't read the Psalms from different versions. Everybody read the same version. That is why we always put these things on paper so that we read the same version. It is corporate. Now, it doesn't stop you when you get to your bedroom. You can read any version you want to read. That is you. But when we are all together worshiping, as a corporate worship, it has to be the same version that is read. So, that's the second point. Bringing the word of God to the people in their vernacular. And thirdly, it was born to reflect that the doctrine and ethics would also be essentially Bible-based. When, again, you look at the 39 articles, for instance, you will find that it clarifies its position right from the start. We do not belong to this or we do not believe this. Rather, this is where we stand. And it is rooted in Scripture. So, this church is a church of the Bible. Somebody say church of the Bible. It is important, therefore, that whatever doctrine, whatever practice you are going to do must be rooted in Scripture. So many things are creeping into our church today that have no basis in Scripture whatsoever. We're just trying to learn what others are doing. And really, they are not anything that brings blessings in any way to the people. We should be careful. They were not just imitating, but we know where we are going. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. So, having been born out of Reformation, this church therefore objects to the excesses of the Roman Catholic, holding on only to the pure traditions of the early church, and it is therefore a Reformed Catholic church. This church is a Reformed Catholic Church. I always like to refer to what I know that um, the one time Archbishop of Canterbury, George Kerry, used to say that this church is both Catholic and Reformed. Really, the point being made there is that we are a Reformed Catholic Church. So, we are not just the same old Catholic, we have been Reformed. And the basis of our Reformation is in Scripture. It's very, very important. So we are a reformed Catholic church and we cannot just go back and that is the irony today that so many of us are almost going back to the things we protested against at the very beginning. We are care carelessly going back into some of those old traditions that we objected to and which even in the 39 articles we object to. I want to challenge you people of God that you take time to understand the 39 articles. There are so many things we are doing now that you will hate that you are doing them because they don't belong there. Sometimes it, it, it disturbs me when I even see how we still handle the matter of the dead or funeral and the kind of things we do or some prayers that we pray. And I wonder where did this one come from? Is this post-reformation or pre-reformation? It's important that we know that we are already reformed. We are a reformed church. Now, the Anglican church is rich in heritage, it's rich in theology, liturgy, and tradition, all of which have been developed over five centuries of its existence. By looking to aspects of the rich heritage of the church, it shall be established that they possess the necessary ingredients for effective ministry in the 21st century. Now, briefly, let's look at the Church of Nigeria and its evangelical heritage. At the close of the 18th century, precisely in 1799, the formation of the Church Missionary Society, or what is now called Church Mission Society, is yet another indication of the purpose for which this church had emerged. The CMS was born, and I quote, to promote the knowledge of the gospel among the hidden. This society further emphasized their belief that only men who had experienced the grace of God in their own hearts and lives were qualified to proclaim the messages of that grace to others. If today somebody is asking about what it means to be born again, and you think you have to go out to borrow it, it means you don't really understand where you belong. This was they believe that 
you must be a converted soul yourself before you can even share the gospel with others. But I know that there are still so many who are in the pulpit and yet they don't seem to have really been converted. May God touch their hearts. May God touch their hearts. Because if you are not, then what are you going to offer the people? So, the heritage that we have believes that only men who had experienced the grace of God in their own hearts and lives were qualified to proclaim the messages of that grace to others. So you cannot give what you do not have. So if you like, this church is the church of new generation, the church of new birth, the church of being born again. This is our heritage. Hallelujah. This church is a church that believes that the gospel, the knowledge of the gospel is very important and must be shared. And that is what it means to be evangelical. So we are not just receiving so that we can dwell and begin to enjoy it. But we get it. We have got to take it out. Share it. So it's not a church that just wants to sit indoor. This is a church that believes in reaching out to the neighborhood. Taking the gospel out. So, these are things that some of us are failing to do in our generation. How long ago was it since you went out into your neighborhood with the gospel? When was the last time that your parish was involved in house to house evangelism? Or you believe that belongs to the Pentecostal churches? That really is our heritage. Some of those things you are going to copy from them actually came from us. They only repackaged it and they call it something else. Today they will call something digging deep. But when you understand it, you find that long ago we had baptism class. We had Bible study class. We had confirmation class. Those are the digging deep opportunities that we have in our church. But now they took it. They don't call it that. They just call it something else. And you think, oh, you are going there to borrow digging deep. But in your own system, there is already a lot of opportunity for you to dig very deep. And it is the failure to dig deep into the word of God that causes our young people to begin to run all over the whole place today. May God Almighty open our eyes afresh. The missionary enterprise of the Church Mission Society in the 19th century in 18, 1842 finally led to the birth of the modern Anglican Church of Nigeria. It was an enterprise that had an integrated approach in which the Bible, civilization, that is education, and the plow, agriculture, were held together. And the missionary effort of the CMS was characteristic, clearly holistic in mission, focusing not only on the Bible, but also on the social aspect of it, on the life of the believer and his community. I'm sure you'll be aware that those who actually fought slave trade were members of the church. They were evangelical members of the church. Thus, the Anglican Church in Nigeria is a child of rigorous evangelical campaign of the CMS, which belonged to the low evangelical tradition of the Church of England. It's particularly important for this to guide the mission and ministry of the Church of Nigeria even now in the 21st century. Brothers, many times I look at some of what we are doing, I get really worried, and inside of me, I cry for our church. Because we have become so confused that we do not know where we belong. We belong rightly within the low evangelical church tradition of the Anglican church. Ours is not a church of uh, rituals and incense. Ours is a church of the world. And nowadays, so many of you want to dress even like uh, the Roman Catholic priests do. And that's what you are doing. But really, ours is a simple church that carries the word seriously. But we seem to be throwing that away. May God revive us and may God bring us back to that knowledge in the name of Jesus Christ. The heritage of the Anglican church is deep and profoundly spiritual. And here again, I want to highlight some more to inform our analysis. And I want to talk about the heritage of prayer. The heritage of prayer. The Anglican church is profound in its daily provisions for both personal and corporate prayers with appropriate lectionary. 
And this suggests that spirituality is not only personal, but also corporate. The Anglican Church is a praying church. What is it? Somebody say it again. So if yours is not, then know that you are not an Anglican. It is a praying church. And its prayers are informed by sound theology and experience of the saints. A careful examination of his daily office shows that its ingredients are fantastic, including confession and absolution, praise and thanksgiving, the ministry of the word, which consists of the Psalms, Old Testament, and New Testament, then affirmation of the creed, and state prayers, which are broad enough to include praying for the state, praying for the church, and praying for the needy in the community. Brothers, let me, let me just challenge you. I don't know if it has struck you as it has struck me, that nowadays so many of our prayers are almost about praying for ourselves. I have been in a service or in services where they will raise almost seven prayer points and all the seven prayer points are about yourself. All the prayer points are about you overcoming your enemy. They are about you fighting the demons. And you begin to wonder what exactly has come upon us. We forget even the basic needs of the people around us. Our prayer book has gone to the extent of even praying for our enemies. But now, it disturbs me when I see some of our people or hear them lead prayers. And we have become a church that now prays and ask people to fall and die. That's what we are doing now. And I ask myself, is this the Anglican heritage that we have? You just have to open your prayer book and see. So I want to beg you and I want to call you today. Let us go back to being original. I am not saying that there are no evil spirits, no enemy. But the Anglicans must be original in how they deal with this issue. Don't allow yourself to be misled by the strange practices of the present time. Go and be original about how you deal with this without borrowing strange practices into our church. Hallelujah. The Book of Common Prayer is the greatest resource for this. And it is to be handled with seriousness and submission to God. The prayers help us to focus a great deal. And a careful look at the Book, book of Common Prayer shows the breadth of its prayers. Unlike the present shallow approach of the present generation that seeks to focus more on the self-needs and concerns about the demons. Rather, our prayers, we pray for the state, we pray for kings, and we pray for the people. Anglican prayers and worship are both corporate and personal and not just self-centered. And they are broad and not narrow, indicative of his commitment as a church of the community. Clearly demonstrated in its liturgy, its vesicles and responses. It is a church, it is a kneeling church where all kneel in humility and unity, regardless of our status. Its prayers are Trinitarian, as evident in the collects, recognizing but not confusing the distinct roles and persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Are you still there? Are you still following me? I know some of you may not like what I'm drawing your attention to. But sometimes it worries me when Anglican clergy who have been trained, who are supposed to be full of theological understanding and spiritually minded, they go to pray and say, oh, we have come today. Holy Spirit, uh, bless us in Jesus' name. We have come today. Jesus, bless us in Jesus' name. God the Father, bless us in Jesus' name. And the kind of prayers we put together, they are so confusing of the roles of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we begin, we, we begin to address our prayers to Jesus and we see complete by praying in Jesus' name. How can we do that? It is simply inconsistent. It is lacking in theology and it fails the test of basic liturgical tenets. I call on you 
to reflect very deeply. We are called upon indeed to be lively in our presentation in leading our people in prayers. But let us do it as people who have knowledge. Let us do it as people who are well rooted. Let us lead as ministers in our generation who are not just copying all kinds of things going on out there, but people who have great interest of the people and we want to give them good leadership. May God help you. I said, may God help you. And that is the problem sometimes. When you pray for your people, you don't say amen until you say in Jesus' name. And then you begin to wonder, what exactly are we saying? Even when there is not much in the content of the prayer, it has to be in Jesus' name before you say the prayer. So many confusion. I want to challenge you to think hard. Pray. Be open to God. There is a lot in this Anglican heritage that can help this church to be effective in its generation. And I pray that as we look into that and handle it effectively, the Lord would empower us. In prayer, the Anglican church is organized. There is a place for everything. Leaving no room for confusion or undue repetition. You only need to look at the theology of the Martins. You will see exactly how this church organizes itself. We begin our worship at the point of confession. Is that not so? What are you confessing? What are you confessing? You confess sins and inadequacies. And thereafter, the clergyman proclaims or pronounces absolution in the name of God. So why is it that when you get to the point of state prayers, you ask people to begin to confess their sin again? Are you following me? I keep wondering, is it that your sin is so much that uh, you have not forgiven yourself, even when God has already forgiven you? At the start of the service, you have confessed sin and God has forgiven you. And now when you get to the place where you should be praying other prayers, you begin to say, hey, brother, pray. Hey, our sin is many. Of course, but you have confessed before God. If you truly confess it, then God can forgive. And he said, I have forgiven you. Why don't you forgive yourself? The situation we are in is such that there is a lot of confusion. But the heritage we have really should help us. Lex orandi, less credendi. That's another very important concept that I want to share with you. Which literally means the law of prayer is the law of belief. The Anglican church demonstrates its belief through its prayers. A careful look at the composition of the Anglican prayers show that its prayers are rooted in scripture and they are all encompassing. Caring for the individual as well as community or social needs. Hence, it is believed to be a community church, a belief that is rooted in its history as a church, where the king or queen is the supreme governor of the church, and where the British parliament once had the responsibility to approve its prayer book. It allows the theology to inform its practice in all things. And that's the point I want to draw out there. That the major challenge that the present day church faces in many of its practices that they run counter to each other, thereby sending wrong signals and confusion to the outside world. At the Bible study this morning, our Father and God, the Bible study leader, asked a question about what strange practices or doctrines and teachings have crept into the church now. And of course, some of you were mentioning a few of them. And when he found that you were not really hitting the nail on the head, he started mentioning some. And another one that struck my mind that I think I should share is the fact that nowadays we come to revivals, we come to prayer vigil with photographs of people. Have you seen that before? We come to revivals with photographs. So when the minister prays, you lift your photograph, the person you want to pray for. And I ask myself, where is this doctrine of the law of prayer is a law of belief? So, is it that our belief and prayers are now working against each other? Where is your faith if you cannot pray for somebody without bringing his photograph? This church is a church of faith where you pray in faith and you find that all that we have is always about faith, praying in faith. So do we need to bring photographs before you can pray for that person? 
Whereas the Bible says, God sends out his word, and the word does what? He heals and delivers them. So all that you need is simply to speak the word. That centurion said to Jesus, when Jesus was coming to his home, he said, look, I'm a man under authority. Don't come to my house. Just speak the word. That's the centurion. So how come that Anglicans, people who should understand, who should be people of faith, we are beginning to run after what others are doing. We are abandoning our heritage. May God help us. I said, may God help us. May God help us. So it's important for us in our generation to understand what we have been called to do. The Anglican spirituality is essentially biblical. In fact, its liturgy is a dramatization of scripture taken from the Psalms, Old Testament, New Testament, and the Gospels read together or alternatively using the same version of Bible or language. Now, two things I want to make here, and I think I want you to actually test it out to know the truth of what I'm saying. When you get home, find some time to sit down. Take your prayer book. Begin to look from the beginning. And you will find that virtually every paragraph of the liturgy is traceable to one scripture or the other. Is that correct? The sentences, scripture. And then you go on to say, the scripture moved us in sundry places. What moved us in sundry places? The scripture. And you look from there, talks about the absolution, you go from there, oh Lord, open our lips. Where is that coming from? In the Psalms. You go to the Gloria, you move from there, you go to praise. It's coming from the Psalm. Or praises unto God. And you go from there, you go to the Psalm. You go from there, you go to the Old Testament. You go from there, the New Testament. You go from, to, from there, maybe you want to do a canticle, perhaps uh, uh, Jubilate Deo or Benedictus, both of which are coming directly from Scripture. You go from there, you go to prayers. Even the prayers together are woven through Scripture. The prayer will complete by saying that uh, you have given us uh, comfort from your word that when two or three are gathered in your name. Is that not so? Where is that one coming from? scripture and you finish and then it's time to now bring the word together and speak to the people brothers i pray you will not fail your generation i say i pray you will not fail god there is a law that is deposited in us we do not need to run anywhere it is already here but we need a warm heart the heart that knows the lord even if it's 50 minutes that you have to share the word let it be one that declares the mind of God to the people. This church has been so well placed. Now, the second point I want to also make about this is the fact that, you know, I now find that many times when somebody is going to read the Bible, even on the lectern, they carry their own version of the Bible there. No, it is not our practice. There is a Bible there which has to be the version that the church uses. So they read from that version for everybody to follow. If my version is NIV, you carry, I carry it there. And then you are holding good news. You are holding KJV. You are holding uh, English Standard Version. We are not reading the same thing. In fact, elsewhere, you may find that you go to church, you find few Bibles. Let me tell you, those many years ago when I went to England, I used to criticize them and say, ah, these people, they indulge people. They don't even want you to come to church. When you get there, they put pew Bibles there for you. But later I got to understand that the reason is that you all read the same version. When you get home, read your other version. But when we are doing corporate worship, read the same version. Celebrating the Anglican heritage. It is rich. And God has deposited it there for us. We do not need to look elsewhere. God has given it to us. The Anglican Church is biblical and orthodox. And this is well articulated in the Chicago Quadrilateral. The 1888 Declaration of the Anglican Communion, often called the Chicago Quadrilateral from 1886, states the Anglican believes in one. The Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Two, the Nicene Creed 
a sufficient statement of the Christian faith. Three, the two sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper with the unfailing use of Christ's words of institution and of the elements ordained by him. And finally, of the historic episcopate locally adapted in the methods of his administration to the very needs of the nations. Now, this summarizes actually those key things that the Anglican Church stands for or believe. One, we have established that of scripture. Two, that there are two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. But don't forget, it says, with the unfailing use of the words of the institution. Very important. Nowadays, it's very convenient for clergy or people to just go about and just put the bread in your hand. Put the bread in your hand. Or even bring the wine there. Somebody came and they was administering the same. I was to receive. So he gave me the bread. So I was looking at him. What is it? He was looking at me. I was looking at him. What is it? He said, oh, the body of Christ. I said, amen. Because if you are giving me, I need to know what is it you are giving me. It is what? The body of Christ. The other person came. Maybe because he thought, uh, as a bishop, he couldn't tell me anything. He just gave me a cup. I was looking at him. So he was looking at me. I said, what is this one? He said, oh, the blood of Christ. I said, ha, amen. <laughs> because I'm not come to just drink anything. It is the blood of Christ. So don't fail to use those words. The body of Christ that keeps you until eternal life. So that is our belief. The unfailing use of the words of the institution. All these are very important to us. The Anglican Church affirms its belief that the word of God alone is sufficient for salvation. Now, even if I'm not able to read through all this, plenty of them are already in your hands. But let me just highlight before we close. The Anglican tripod, which I believe should help us in whatever we are doing, even in moments of confusion. In doing this theology, Anglicanism engages in the tripod of scripture, tradition, and reason. That is, it examines its ethics and constructs its theology using the scripture with the support of the traditions of the church, whilst employing human reason appropriately. As a reformed church, scripture is above all the final authority. Similarly, its ethics and practices are informed by a thorough integrated approach in which the scripture takes a prominent place. By adopting this approach, it underlines its relationship with the early church and their traditions and with the contemporary world by employing reason. The church is evangelical in faith and salvation is by faith in Christ and Christ is the only way and Christ is our sacrificial lamb. So the word of God is the primary tool for our mission. We should ensure that we are constant in understanding the word of God. But then, where the word of God is not very clearly stated in terms of what you are going to do, the question we then ask is, how has it been practiced by the fathers of the church? That is where tradition comes in. And then we ask ourselves, how reasonable is this now? The reason must not contradict scripture. It must rather support it. And we must understand it. That is why understanding our theological premise is very, very important for us. So, celebrating the Anglican heritage is a call for an interaction between the history, theology, and practices of the Anglican Church as a way to discern veritable ingredients to providing effective Anglican ministry. And I pray that the God, the Lord Almighty, would help us to be able to do this effectively in the name of Jesus. So our heritage today, where are we? And this is the question I keep asking, brothers. What has become of our church and our heritage? All that we see many times is the army of confused pastors who have lost originality and are simply chasing shadows. The question really then is, 
Why is the Anglican Church in Nigeria losing its heritage and holding on to nothing that has any depth? The confusion that has attended our spirituality today is a cause of concern. Many are abandoning the Bible for borrowed practices. Liturgical and theological inconsistencies are now showing up in our church. In the use of robes and vestments, we now wear all kinds of things that are not even part of our own tradition. These are critical issues, and I think so many people would be struggling to understand this. But really, we don't have to go the way of the Anglo-Catholics if we are to maintain our Anglican evangelical heritage to which we belong in Nigeria. Some are gradually drifting into errors in their attempt to imitate what non-Anglicans are doing so that they can be relevant or be seen to be effective. Let me just say that what the Lord has given to us, if we understand it and allow the Holy Spirit to help us, we can use those things to reach people in this generation in a dynamic and lively way and it will be to the glory of the almighty God. So understanding and celebrating the Anglican heritage can enhance ministry in the following ways. Number one, they can they understand the book of common prayer and be guided by its profound provisions and prayers. Number two, use the word of God to reach the unreached and nurture the faithful in a way that is sincere. Number three, allow the ministry of the Holy Spirit and use of gifts, charisma, without manipulation. Be charismatic and Pentecostal, but Anglican evangelical. Bearing, be mindful of what the church believes or affirms. Number four, be a church for the community in caring for its needs and in serving it at every time. Use the liturgy in times of rogation weeks and on other occasions to take the church to the people. This is Anglicanism in its dynamism to be there for its community. Number five, do not abandon the evangelical heritage of the church for rituals and be careful about indiscriminate borrowing of practices and robes or vestments. Let us be careful that we are not abandoning our evangelical heritage. Even sometimes when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, some of the practices and genuflections that some of us do, I wonder whether we read about Reformation at all. Number six, dynamism in dealing with the challenges of the time. The church is dynamic enough to adjust to the challenges of the community without losing its biblical essence. Somebody say biblical essence. Very important. We are dynamic enough to know where to change, but without losing that important part of us that is established in the scriptures. For instance, there has emerged a new type of realignment within the Anglican Communion. Owing to the revisionist agenda of many Anglican provinces on the homosexual and similar issues of the present age, the formation of the Global Anglican Future Conference, GAFCON, point to the seriousness of the present Anglican situation. And we are called to stand firm and defend the faith that has been delivered once to us. So Anglican theology is biblical and orthodox. It professes the faith uniquely delivered and taught in the ecumenical creeds of the early church. Evangelical Anglicans are called to defend the faith once delivered. So before I close, let me just tell you brothers and say, I want to ask you to think Anglican when you are doing your things. Think Anglican and act Anglican. Because when you do, you never get it wrong. You would always understand it. Permit me to make just one point about the service this morning. I already spoke to the conductor of our worship about it. And I said that when you do the, the prayers, the clergyman is supposed to occupy the prayer desk. It is not from the chancel that you do that prayer. Our attention is to be right here. The center only is the cross. That is Anglican. So do your prayers right from the desk. It is when you now go with the offering that you do, you conclude it over there. 
That is the Anglican thing. And I said to him, when you finish the, the hymn, and then you said, oh, thank you. Please let us pray. I said, no, it is not Anglican. The Anglican thing is, the Lord be with you. And what do you say? Let us pray. Let us do it in a way that others will know that we belong somewhere. Have you noticed that in spite of the challenges of the present world, the Roman Catholics have remained Catholics. But we, we keep moving and running around. And let us train our children to love it. Because it is biblical. And there is history behind it. We shifted from what we believe was not spiritual to doing what is right. We are reformed. Let us now go back again. May the Lord help us. In summary, the Anglican heritage can be said to consist of its roots in history as a reformed Catholic church. This is clearly demonstrated in the theology of the Lord's Supper and the articles of faith. And let me say that so much you will find in greater details in this book and you can engage and if you have issues, then communicate with me. I'll be happy to debate it or clarify with you. Also important is the centrality of the scripture to its life as a church. The Anglican church dramatizes the scripture in many ways, especially in its liturgy, which goes to show what it believes. Much more, it values its tradition as passed on and is able to adapt to any local situation without losing its heritage, its identity, and without compromising the scripture that so defines it. I know that we are trying to be relevant today. But it's also, it pains me many times when I find that we are borrowing things that have become so superficial. There are so many slangs out there now. And we also borrow them. We don't even think about them. We borrow them and begin to use them. Let us think twice. Think Anglican. As I said, you know all these common, common hymns. Uh, when success comes my way, I will praise the Lord. Some of you are aware of that. You know that. But actually, is it only when success comes your way you want to praise the Lord? But that is what everybody is singing nowadays. Where is the Anglican going to? Let us think about this and understand what we have been called to do. Let's not just, on the name of uh, being evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal, because of revival, we just want to use all kinds of slangs that have no basis in scripture and our tradition. Let us use what is right. And God will use them to bring life to his church. This is effective Anglican ministry in the 21st century. It must be Nigerian enough in its application. Why not compromising the crux of biblical Christianity? That the church of Nigeria, the CMS church, is a Bible-based church, is a clear enough statement that our reason and tradition must not contradict our scripture. Rather, they must complement and enrich our Christianity. This is a calling that must not be compromised, even in the 21st century. Therefore, Paul calls the believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, to stand firm. Despite being in a foreign land and in the face of opposition, Daniel did not compromise his faith in the God of Israel. Our church also must scrutinize and critically evaluate itself to ensure that both its theology and practices are consistent with its evangelical tradition and the Bible. I pray that as we do this, the Lord will bless us. The Lord will use us for his glory. And then we'll find that we can be effective when we understand what, what God has given to us. And let's be careful about just borrowing anyhow from anywhere. We are supposed to be givers. They should be borrowing from us, learning from us. Let us stand faithful to our own calling, to our heritage. And there is a Lord that guides us in it. We don't have so much time, but I want to encourage you to reflect back on the heritage of the Anglican Church, which is so rich. And in it, you will find a lot of blessing. It shall be well in the name of Jesus.